for the second seminar of the Gender and Peace Building seminar series uh, that are um, co-sponsored by uh, the USIP Gender uh, Working Group and the Institute for Inclusive Security. Uh, on November 3rd, we had the first seminar and we discussed the necessity of engaging women in negotiations and ways in which that can be done. It was a very nice discussion. Uh, today we are shifting our focus to security and the reform of security institutions um, and approaches. So I would like to begin just by con to contextualize um, some of these issues we're dealing with with a story, a story that was shared um, with me that um, I think really puts out um, some of the, the issues that we could be coming up against when we're trying to um, address issues of security in women. So there's, um, this is a, a story about somewhere in Africa. Um, we have a young NGO worker coming into a community um, with the task of trying to figure out what, have, what, um, what can be done about the problem of women getting raped when they go to get water at dusk. So this young um, project manager uh, calls a town meeting and she says to everyone that you know comes uh, shows up at the meeting she says we really have a problem in this community and we're getting together here gathering in order to solve that problem to identify solutions to that problem she said we have women are getting raped consistently when they're going out um, to get water and uh, you know let's talk about what we can do a man gets up um, raises a hand and says the water is coming back what's the problem so um, what do you do in these instances, right? When we're trying to address some of the problems, um, but we are coming up with resistance um, in the local community, what do we do? What kind of um, issues uh, can we raise? What kind of dialogue can we have so that these sorts of mindsets uh, can change? So it is likely that we can encounter such mindsets in our work. Um, that, that we do as we strive to solicit the participation of women in our various peace building efforts uh, or projects. The threats to the security of women uh, during a conflict and its aftermath are different than that of the men. And these threats are as varied as they are numerous. Let's consider, for example, that women are often shut out of DDR programs, either because they have no weapons to hand in, whether they are bushwives, or share the weapon with others so they don't have their own weapon to, to hand in and participate, um, or they believe that they will not find mm -hmm. a husband if they are recorded as having, a co uh, having been a combatant, um, or they may be prosecuted for their actions. As a result, they are forced to live on the streets and susceptible to human trafficking, prostitution, and uh, of course, no education for them and their children. Let's also consider that post-conflict environments are rife for domestic violence which ensues when the man comes home and tries to cope with a new gender balance in the household as well as economic and social hardships. We cannot claim to have established peace uh, when women are being abused in their homes. So what do we do? The purpose of this seminar series is to basically offer two types of crucial instruments or, or tools for us to um, engage women in identifying solutions to security threats. First is to give us guidance in making convincing arguments for those that remain skeptical about the importance of engaging women in identifying the path to peace and implementing those solutions. The second are concrete approaches, tools, um, to elicit the contribution of women in peace building efforts. We have to listen to women and we have to be flexible uh, and creative. The following quote is an example of what we can encounter if we really listen. A woman should know her limits, and if not, then it's her husband's right to beat her. But if a woman earns more than her husband, it's difficult for him to discipline her. Right? We, have, we get to listen to various points of views, um, and we can identify solutions uh, that way by, by listening to, to the women and engaging them. Today we have three distinguished panelists uh, who have been thinking and working uh, about uh, in these areas for quite some time, and um, they have seen the exclusion and marginalization of women, um, you know, firsthand. Their presentations will help equip us to foster peace-building solutions that include 
a gender perspective. You'll notice that on the invitation, General Kamert um, was also going to join us to share his insight. However, he was just this past weekend deployed to Chad, so he cannot be with us. However, he was very kind to put together some uh, recommendations and some um, <coughs> ideas that he has uh, based on his experience, and you can pick them up outside. We uh, put them out for you. So with uh, no, for, well, before I, I present our speakers, I want to tell you that this event is being webcasted. We have um, uh, on our website, uh, you know, people can watch this event. Uh, the main purpose is uh, to allow uh, members of the Women Wage Peace Network, uh, which is um, uh, worked, works with inclusive security, to participate. During our question and answer discussion uh, section, they will, if they are interested or if they have um, you know, something to weigh in, they will send us an email and we'll try to incorporate their comments, their questions, or their recommendations um, to us in the, um, in, in the discussion. So we'll be reading their emails as they, if and when they come in. So uh, with no further ado, I'll introduce my uh, colleagues and um, our panel uh, in an order that they will be speaking. Uh, Jack, Jackie O'Neill, and you have, by the way, the bios outside, so I'm going to let them uh, get going with their presentations. But Jackie, who's from uh, the Institute <coughs> for Inclusive Security, um, is going to speak about the specific contributions that women make in the security sector and the concrete, concrete recommendations to engage them. Uh, Toby Whitman will be, uh, who's with uh, USAID, um, is going to be talking to us about um, the lessons learned on operationalizing women's engagement with the military. And Scott Carlson, who is an advisor at USIP, um, the Rule of Law uh, Center, will be using broadly accepted, uh, or will talk about, sorry, using broadly accepted human rights principles to structure programs, analysis, and relationships in a post-conflict environment, leading to the empowerment of women and the establishment of stable and inclusive institutions. So I will turn it over to Jackie, and uh, then we'll, we'll go through the different presentations. Uh, if you have pressing questions <laughs> after one, each presentation, um, you know, please just write them down or something so we can go through all the different uh, presentations first, and then you can you know, form a line by the microphone and then <coughs> make comments or questions or uh, you know, engage in the discussion as you wish. Okay? Uh, thank you, Nadia, for... Um, for moderating and for creating the seminar series with us and also for your leadership on this issue within USIP. Um, and of course, thanks to USIP for hosting us and also for making this available online. And this webcast is a really exciting thing for us. As Nadia mentioned, uh, Inclusive Security supports a women waging peace network uh, of about 1,000 women peace builders around the world. And Nadia and USIP really wanted them to be able to engage in activities like this and, and not just sort of be broadcast later online, but be online <coughs> in real time so that they can actually contribute. So I heard from a number of our network members uh, from Pakistan, Iraq, uh, Sudan, Liberia, and elsewhere who said they were going to tune in. Um, technical uh, abilities permitting, and uh, I really hope that they're watching now and that we'll be able to hear from them. Uh, I want to start with uh, just sort of mentioning how I became engaged in this subject uh, as it relates to Sudan in particular. In 2005, uh, I, was in, I was living in Khartoum, and I was working three days a week at the UN peacekeeping mission at UNMIS. Uh, and then I was working three days a week at uh, all women's university called Afad University. And so I'd spend three days working these, with these women leaders who were doing this really tremendous work, uh, very active politically and working uh, very hard on Sudan's reconstruction. And then I'd go to the UN office and work with some very, very hardworking and very well-meaning people who were working on the same issues. And uh, unfortunately, never did the two worlds really ever meet. And it became very clear to me that there was an incredible lost opportunity there, that there were people with very similar and shared objectives who were really not connecting. The U.S., or sorry, the U.N. Uh, staff people really had uh, no idea of the capacity and the activities that the Sudanese women were already engaged in leading, and the Sudanese women leaders really had no idea how to access the U.N., and that's how I became uh, engaged in this, in this topic to begin with. Um, 
Soon after that, I began working with the Institute for Inclusive Security. And as many of you know, we're a DC-based advocacy organization, and we promote the full inclusion of all stakeholders, especially women, in peace processes around the world. And when we say peace processes, we define it broadly as meaning everything from actual negotiations, so being at the table when peace agreements are negotiated, to implementing peace agreements, which of course has a major component related to the security sector. And I was drawn at first to inclusive security's very pragmatic approach, uh, in that we argue that uh, women need to be involved in peace processes and peace building, not because it's their right to be there, although we do believe that to be true, but because when women are engaged and are involved, it creates a more sustainable and more lasting peace. So we advocate to policymakers around the world, we provide training to women leaders, uh, and also to civil servants, to the military, and to police around the world, and we conduct research to document the very specific uh, contributions that women make to peace building. And I want to open and begin with uh, discussing a, a case study that we recently wrote up. And it relates to a provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar in Afghanistan. So one of the women that we work with, one of the members of our Women Waging Peace Network, uh, works and created a women's economic empowerment organization in Kandahar. And they began selling their handicrafts on the base of the provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar. And one day while she was at the PRT base, a female Canadian uh, NATO officer, so a female military officer, approached her and said, I'd really like to have some interaction with Afghan women. I'd really like to just talk to Afghan women. Can you help me? And so what our network member did was she created, she gathered members of her organization and reached out to some other women, including stay-at-home moms, farmers, a whole wide range of Afghan women. And they decided, they got together and they agreed with NATO forces on a safe place to meet. In this case, it was the uh, Kandahar airport. So they started to meet uh, and ended up meeting fairly regularly. And the nature of this discussion started with very um, general topics, such as what are your concerns for your children? Uh, what are the issues that, what do you want for your children in the future? What are, what are issues that you're just dealing with right now? And the women started to say very interesting and important things. Uh, they started to talk about corruption in some of the projects that the PRT was funding. They started to talk about priorities for development that were different than what NATO officials had heard to date. Uh, they gave information about areas that uh, were too insecure for NATO officials themselves to even travel in, which again were different than what uh, NATO officials had heard from the, from the beginning. And the NATO officials told us later that uh, they really noticed an increased sense of local ownership of, um, among the people in Kandahar, and, and even if it was this small group. Uh, and I think this, uh, this next point sort of sums up one of the best outcomes of what happened. In, in June 2008, there was a massive prison break in Kandahar, and about 700 detainees escaped from the prison. And one of the women who was a part of these sort of focus groups, these discussion groups, lived near the prison, uh, heard that something was going on, started hearing explosions, and on her cell phone called her contact at NATO. So she called the one woman that she knew who worked uh, for the military, and she said there's something happening at the prison. That woman at that NATO contact, who had engaged with these women, these Afghan women over time, found out about that prison break 10 minutes before anyone else on, at NATO headquarters did. 10 minutes in a prison break is a very long time. Uh, and it just goes to show that uh, the goals of these women who were participating in this group were very much the same uh, as those of the NATO officials. And there were, there were some very concrete benefits to them for actually taking the time and making the effort to talk to them. So with that story in mind, I wanted to give, as Nadia mentioned, some very uh, concrete and specific uh, talking points, basically, on the contributions that women make when they're engaged in the security sector. And I want to point out first that at Inclusive Security in particular, we define the security sector broadly. So of course, it includes police and military and armed contractors. Uh, it also includes people working in justice and corrections, uh, those in management or executive bodies, departments of state, departments of defense, et cetera. Uh, there are official civilian oversight capacity, so legislators and parliamentarians who have oversight roles related to the security sector. And then, of course, those providing uh, unofficial civilian oversight, like the media, think tanks, academia, et cetera. So when I say women's engagement in the security sector, 
Uh, I do mean specifically in uniform services, but also in the broader scope of oversight and um, realization of security, basically. So what specific contributions do women make when they're engaged in the security sector? First and foremost, they improve operational effectiveness. So namely, they improve a mission's ability to reach its objectives. There are studies of women uh, in police forces in the United States that show that when uh, women police officers are more likely to de-escalate tensions and they're less likely to use excessive force. Women can also gather different types of intelligence. There are some things, for example, that women are just more likely to tell other women. In General Khmer's remarks that are outside, he notes that in Liberia, uh, rates of reporting sexual violence increased dramatically uh, when the all-women Indian Formed Police Unit started being able to accept these reports. Having women in police and military in particular also means that they can get a more full picture of the community's actual needs. So they can get a better sense of what security issues are most, most pressing. Is it drugs? Is it human trafficking? Is it sexual violence? Many of these are issues that women will talk about. There was a great study that came out last year uh, of five different provincial <coughs> reconstruction teams in Afghanistan. Uh, and one of them, I'll, I'll quote from the part where, uh, from the Dutch, uh, uh, Afghan, or sorry, the Dutch PRT in Afghanistan, uh, where it says, the team had the impression that many Afghan men found the women to be interesting. Informants were, according to the commander of police trainers, prone to be more open and even more accepting of female staff. According to the PRT commander, talking to a female ev officer even, quote, loosened men's tongues, unquote, which provided the PRT with very useful information. Women can also provide uh, or perform some roles that men simply can't, such as uh, physical searches of other women at border, uh, border points and border checkpoints. Having more women in police and military services also increases the ownership, uh, local ownership, of these security forces. I think we've all come to the point now where we acknowledge that communities need to be able to see themselves in their police and their military. So we have to have a diversity of races, of ethnicities, of religions, and the same goes for gender. In the areas of justice and corrections, women have been found uh, to be more likely to identify and prioritize the prosecution of sexual crimes. In Sierra Leone in 2002, there were 250,000 women who had been raped in the Civil War. And there were women in the special court following, uh, following the war who developed a special prosecution plan for sexual violence. They assigned female investigators, they uh, created sensitive interviewing techniques and more. Having women in the security section can reduce at least the perception of corruption, if not corruption itself. Uh, Nicaragua, for example, uh, had a massive police reform program in which they increased the number of women police officers to now uh, one of being one of the highest in the world at about 25%. And they credit that with a massive turnaround in public confidence in the police force. And as Nadia mentioned earlier, women are also essential to facilitating the reintegration of combatants in DDR processes. So they tend to deliver, as you can imagine, many of the services that are actually critical to reintegration and tend to be there and, and stay in communities much longer than the international community does following a DDR process. And there's also growing evidence that women can be highly influential in the disarmament process itself. There's a new book coming out by a woman named Vanessa Farr called Sexed Pistols about women um, and small arms. And she looks quite specifically at the role of older women in the community and the moral influence that they have over young men and their ability to and their interest in disarming and surrendering their weapons. So I could go on but want to turn briefly to some very specific <coughs> suggestions for actually engaging women in the security sector. Uh, and I'd say these recommendations are aimed primarily at people working in large institutions as I imagine many of you are. Uh, such as government departments, civilian agencies, the UN, NATO, the OSCE and others. So first and foremost, I think by far the most important thing to do if you want to increase attention paid to this issue is focus on raising a awareness about women's specific contributions to operational effectiveness. So in other words, focus on helping people understand why engaging women makes their jobs easier. It can't be perceived as an add-on or a nice to have. It has to be understood as absolutely integral to a mission success. And people need very specific examples to know why. So document those examples and share them, especially ones that occur in your own organization. Write them up as talking points and get them into speeches. Get them into newsletters, on your intranet, uh, in training materials, et cetera. I can't stress enough that no one else is going to write these down. And if you see, in particular, a good news story, write it down and share it. 
Secondly, acknowledge that awareness and goodwill on this subject aren't enough. Some approaches are straightforward and they're readily apparent, but some are sensitive and challenging uh, to identify, so people really need training. But I would emphasize that not all training is created equal, and some training, quite frankly, is very bad. Uh, a lot of police and military, for example, are told to avoid eye contact with women or to avoid contact altogether so as to risk not offending them. Again, it usually comes from a genuine and well-meaning place. We work in, at inclusive security with a lot of police and military deployed to Afghanistan in particular, and we hear this again and again. What we also hear is that people are told to do this when they start. They realize about six months into their deployment that it's not true, that there are ways that they can reach out to and engage with Afghan women, and then it's time for them to go home, and it's too late. And then a new rotation comes in with the exact same problem. So if you're see overseeing the delivery of training, uh, or delivering it yourself, assess it. First of all, is it happening? And second, are they talking about anything practical? Or is it simply a review of theoretical frameworks related to gender? Which may be necessary, but really not all that helpful when someone gets into the field. And thirdly, who's delivering it? Is it a junior woman, or is it a senior or high-ranking man? It matters, especially related to gender, who delivers this training. Uh, thirdly, if you're overseeing these types of programs, re require a certain proportion of the trainees to be women. Uh, I came back just a few months ago from doing some work with the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, and met a number of great people working on police training programs, including a, a man who told me they were advising their local partners at an OSCE mission uh, and providing police training, and he said, I always insist that there be at least 25% women in the trainings that the OSC runs. And he said, my local partners sometimes send me lists of trainees and there are no women on them. And I just send them back. I just say, there need to be 25% women on this list. And sometimes they'll send them back and say, no, 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 we can't find them. They're just not there. They're not available. And he says, no, they're there and I know you can find them. So it, doing that shows that you mean what you say and it also puts women in the position of gaining the skills and uh, the recognition among their own colleagues and improving their ability to actually do the job well once they get there. The same man also told me that in those training sessions, women are almost always some of the best contributors to the sessions. So don't be afraid to say that to fund something, we need to have a minimum percentage of women. And I'd say the same goes for study tours and delegations, et cetera. There's no shame in asking and being very specific and saying we want to have 25% or even higher proportion of women. Third, you need visible and very senior level support, especially from men. People have to know that this gender issue is not just a passing fad or something that they're doing for political correctness. And there are a lot of strong and very excellent men on this issue. So find them in your organizations and profile them. Uh, get them to do this work and give them a very specific role. It makes them look good and it's important. Uh, and the symbolism of it can't be understated. Fourth. Uh, Start early. The earlier you get women involved in a process, the easier it is for them to be engaged later on. So inclusive security focuses a lot on women in peace negotiations because that's where a lot of very critical issues are determined. Uh, UNIFEM released a study last year showing that 2% of the signatories to peace agreements are women. 2% of signatories. And the UN, I'll point out, has never appointed a woman as its lead mediator to any conflict. So we need women, uh, or we need to include women in U.S. and other country delegations to negotiations, and we need to insist that the U.N. and other agencies do the same. And finally, recruit and retain more women. It's easy to say, but hard to do. Uh, but it's absolutely critical to get more women in the pipeline, so to speak, and to have more women at senior levels. Um, again, hard to do, but I'd say one of the the positive aspects of this is that women around the world uh, face many of the same challenges and have many of the same reasons for not engaging in the security sector. Inclusive Security worked with the State Department, the U.S. State Department, a few years ago uh, to look at why there are so few women police officers who sign up to be uh, serving on, in U.S. and U.N.-led uh, peacekeeping missions around the world. And what we found was the same thing for U.S. women as for women around the world. Two main issues. One, they lacked an awareness of what the job involved. So they were looking at um, advertisements that showed men in camouflage carrying machine guns jumping out of helicopters as advertisements for serving in a UN peacekeeping mission. Anyone who will do that in particular in the police will tell you, first of all, UN police are not armed, so they won't be carrying machine guns. They're not jumping out of helicopters. What they're doing is relating to the community. 
uh, one of the what they should be doing is relating to the community. And we found that women police officers in the U.S. in particular just didn't have a strong handle of what the role would actually involve. And secondly, and I think this applies broadly to women around the world uh, from our experience, is that they lacked confidence to do that. They didn't see other women role models in the security sector who were telling them, no, it's important, you bring important uh, features to this job, uh, and you can do it. And so uh, one of the ways that we're addressing that with Nadia's colleagues here at USIP uh, is through INPRAL, uh, trying to create an online network of women in the security force or in the, in the security sector so that they can actually engage with each other and share much more realistic stories about what it's like to be working in the field, uh, to be what the recruitment processes are like, what actual conditions are like, and encourage women uh, to build that confidence and build their interest in serving in the security sector. And finally, on this note, I would add create very specific targets for recruiting uh, women and create incentives for actually meeting them. So if you're evaluating contractors, for example, who are required to or who are recruiting women, uh, favor ones who have proven their ability to recruit uh, and promote women. Put these responsibilities in formal job descriptions and then actually evaluate people's performance against them. <coughs> and finally, consider providing additional funds or even special recognition for those who do increase the number of women uh, in their recruitment or uh, in their uh, ability to actually promote them to senior levels. So I know uh, Toby and Scott have a lot more to add on that, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. That was very insightful. I'm sure you are, have many takeaways already um, from this, so that's, that's very good. We'll turn it over to Toby. And, um, yeah. So uh, first off, just a huge thanks to, to Nadia and USIP and Institute for Inclusive Security for organizing this, sem this very important seminar series um, and for extending the invitation uh, to me for this event. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about the lessons learned on operationalizing women's engagement specifically with the military at the tactical operational level. But I wanted to start out with a story about Liberia to highlight several points. And I'm hopeful we might have some Liberians um, participating via the web. So as many of you know, Liberia has undergone an incredible transformation since decades of civil war. President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf has set very ambitious security sector reform goals for her country to turn the armed forces of Liberia into something that people run to rather than run away from. The U.S. has played a very large role in that transformation, admittedly, sometimes controversially. I know a U.S. Navy officer from my work in Liberia who was seconded there as part of the Office of Defense Coordination to help the reconstruction of the AFL in 2007. One day he was participating in an AFL recruitment event and he hadn't received any specific instructions for the event aside to facilitate the sign-up day for new cadets. At the event in Monrovia, he noticed that throughout the day there were tremendous numbers of women who were waiting in line to register but that oftentimes the men were cutting in line in front of them and they were never getting up to actually register. He actually thought that a lot of the women were even leaving and were never even, um, never ultimately participating. So while he hadn't been given explicit orders that day to access, to address women's participation, he knew that he wasn't achieving his objective of ensuring that the maximum number of candidates were registered that day. So what did my wonderful Navy officer friend do? He didn't form a working group or create guidelines, but he created two lines, one for men and one for women to register. And the women were able to get up to the registration desk. So I like this story for two reasons. Number one, uh, it shows that increasing women's engagement in security sector is not rocket science. It takes common sense. And number two, it shows how engaging with women helped to support his overall mission. It was a very, very pragmatic approach that proved to, to him involving, that proved that involving women helped to advance his institutional and specific goals. So while in this room, uh, we think that women's engagement, we think about women's engagement as both a rights issue and a practical issue, the best and easiest, and I think in this case, easy is on our side way into the practices of other groups is to show them how this is in their own best interest, similar to what Jackie is saying. We need to focus on all of these win-wins first as the fastest way to build momentum around the issue. It's the lowest hanging fruit, 
and it's a mistake for us not to focus on grabbing it first. The rights issue can become a capstone once we've made progress with all of the rest. For my own work with the military via US aid and with those in civil society abroad trying to work with the military, I believe the key to increasing engagement with women is through these practical considerations. I want to speak a little about a tool created by US aid that really illustrates what it means to practically convince not just civilian actors, but the military to engage women as resources for stabilization. The tool is, called, is the, the tool is used in stability operations and is called TCAF, the Tactical Conflict Assessment and Planning Framework. TCAF was designed for both civilian and military practitioners working in unstable environments to identify local causes of instability, to design activities to counter those drivers of instability, and to measure overall impact. To date, TCAF has been used in Anbar province in Iraq, across southern and southern eastern Afghanistan, by marine units, army units, and by USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. It was just part of an interagency conflict assessment in Ecuador, and we're in dialogue right now to implement the tool in the Horn of Africa in Kenya. At its core, TCAF is an assessment tool with questions about the priority concerns of the local area and root causes of instability. But what's critical to the tool's success is that, analyzer, that analyzers interact with the population, not just part of the population, but all segments of the population, and that means women too. We have essentially made the argument to the military that women are a critical part of a counterinsurgency strategy. If General McChrystal says to understand the local population, we are emphasizing to brigade commanders down to staff sergeants that the local population includes women. This means non-commissioned officers who might not have joined the military to talk to local women now need to engage with women to be effective at their mission, stability operations. We make these points in our training in the model, an intensive multi-day pre-deployment training. So to reiterate Jackie's point, training is essential to help, first to make the case for why engaging with women is important, and number two, really practically, how do you do it? And specifically if you're in a unit with no female personnel and with no female interpreters, which is sadly often the case. What we found as well is providing examples of what it actually looks like when you engage women, when you engage only men versus what it looks like when you engage only women is really important. And we kind of have it easy because we are collecting a database of gender disaggregate data and can visualize the different priorities that women have, be it health, education, irrigation, security. But providing that tangible evidence in other circumstances is critical and speaks to the power of gender disaggregated data and the critical role that institutions have in requiring that. So what's exciting about this is that it's not just the US military that's been benefiting with this tool. Women really are getting their voices heard and they're contributing to activity to design. And it's a win-win situation. Now I'm certainly not going to say that it's perfect as it exists. It's a work in progress, particularly in Afghanistan, where it can be challenging to access women, and we do need to do it better. But I think the example is worthwhile because I feel that we have made the case successfully and that there is a demand for perfecting how to actually do it. So how do you do it? If we want to think about lessons learned on actually engaging with women from a tactical perspective, I have some recommendations, both from the TCAF experience and from others. First off, like the story that I started with, don't overthink it. Gender mainstreaming sounds very, very daunting. Being practical is very straightforward. So think like the Navy officer at the, at the uh, AFL recruitment event. Secondly, we need to promote more civil military cooperation to include women. When we do our training with military units, we encourage them often to work through partnerships with other US government citizens, civilians, US aid implementing partners, contractors hired specifically to conduct TCAF assessments, and even parts of the host nation government. Some of these actors have more women in their ranks, can hire women more easily to fill the need, or simply have more flexibility to interact with women by virtue of being the same nationality as the local population. Just because the military has a paucity of women doesn't mean that there aren't other options. 
Which brings me to speaking about the need for increasing the number of women within formal military institutions. I don't think we can really talk about increasing interaction with local women without addressing this issue. And I don't want to beat a dead horse or say that by, in every instance you need women to interact with women, but it certainly can help. And we know that many times women have been able to, women in the formal military have been asked, have been more easily able to access women and there are great success stories of that. One, uh, one example is a new Marine Corps uh, female engagement team or FETS. A report on their activities found that the approach works very well with benefits among the population that can't be achieved by men. The report says, quote, female Marines are extended the respect shown to men, but granted the access reserved for women. Fets were often invited into areas in Afghanistan where all male units were not. And when the patrols returned, they discovered that, quote, some Afghan women had been anticipating the opportunity to meet with American women. In one home, the women said that they had caught glimpses of the patrolling FET through a crack in the wall and that they had prayed that you would come to us, unquote. The fact that the Afghan women welcomed return visits indicated that their partners hadn't punished them for speaking to Americans as many, as many individuals often think. So it's not just recruitment and retention with, with women in formal institutions, but making sure that they're in the right places. So the issue is really having commanders with enough foresight to assign his or her female soldiers or Marines to line units to work with female interpreters to access the perceptions of the female population. There are female soldiers and Marines, but they're often in logistical, medical, or other support units, and there are usually very few who are assigned to combat battalions. So one creative approach that Marines have used in Afghanistan to address this, they've actually formed a specific unit of women at the Marine Expeditionary Brigade level, very high level division, um, division level, that they then travel around to different areas and are kind of the, the expert female force. Another recommendation is to create a demand for more female interpreters. We hear this time and time again, time and time again in our trainings. Men can work effectively with female interpreters to engage local women, and this is a very leveraged way of increasing access to the population. There's also the side of the potential benefit of economically empowering local women who, when we cre increase the demand for this type of functionality. So we tell many of the military units that we work with on TCAF, please request female interpreters. Another important recommendation, and this is uh, within the military community and, and really across the international, um, international community, is that we all, we need, institutions need to execute better transitions of personnel during deployments. All of the strands often are dropped when one group leaves an area and a new group enters and you have to reweave a cloth of connections with a new, in, during a new assignment. This is costly in all measurements, but it's very, very costly for connections that have been developed with women, where personal relationships can often take time to develop. We need better transitioning of key women contacts across redeployments. Leave a list of key contacts. If there are deployment overlaps, make introductions, but don't let hard relationships, don't let hard earned relationships wither. One example I have specifically is working with a uh, women's advocacy organization in Liberia called Security for Women Through Advocacy Coalition. They had developed an amazing relationship with the head of the Office of Defense Coordination at the U.S. Embassy in Liberia and had coordinated um, a series of events to bring their, uh, their network members um, to, and AFL members into high schools um, and colleges to recruit um, women to join the forces and when the, the colonel of that office left, the entire effort floundered and they had to start from scratch and lost valuable time and resources. Lastly, we need to be patient and flexible with, with accessing women in the field and we need to be creative. One army unit um, who was doing TCAF analysis in eastern Paktika um, had very, very difficult circumstances on the ground. It's a very unstable environment. Um, but what happened is that they ended up building trust with the men in the local community through some of their military doctors who were providing health care 
um, at first to the men, and then ultimately we were providing health care services to the women. And they ended up having conversations with those women about their priorities, but they, they did it through the, the guises of developing trust through the health clinic. So going about it through, um, through a lateral, uh, lateral entry point um, was really helpful for them to ultimately um, to have further conversations. Uh, highlighting other specific examples from Afghanistan of how to meet with, right, with local women, um, the critical importance of, of recognizing um, how, to, how to create secure environments for meeting with local women, particularly for the military, getting outside the wire, um, establishing points of contact that are off base, organizing regular meetings, but being conscious of varying the dates and times of those meetings, um, and varying the dates and those times of those meetings for, for times that make sense for local women. What, are, what fits best into their schedule? When are they most flexible? And how can we facilitate their participation, either through reimbursements for travel costs, childcare, other ways to make it easier for them? So I like sharing those kinds of details because it gives you, uh, you know, examples of the kinds of tangible, um, tangible uh, things to be thinking about. But I don't want to be so prescriptive as well because it isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. It's, you know, thinking about the, the kinds of questions that you have to ask in different environments to figure out the best way to interact with women. So in conclusion, I feel very optimistic. I think there is incredible rising awareness in the military, particularly around the growth of stability operations, that women are resources to accomplishing the mission. It's just really now about uh, consistent implementation, the devil being in the details, but with more opportunities like this seminar to share these practices, hopefully we'll get there. Thank you. It uh, demystifies things rather than increases the fog. Um, I'm struck by what uh, the speakers before me, Jackie and Toby, were stressing, which is this notion of including women and that being a, a force in and of itself for stabilization. And I think uh, I'm coming at this from a human rights-based approach, and what I want to do is sort of talk about what some of the principles are that motivate us in many of our international interventions and are supposed to guide the way we structure our operations. But I think that uh, in reality, we don't walk the talk. And what I'd like to do is uh, describe a little bit of what I think the talk is and how it might look uh, if we walked it. Uh, and in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights as the lens for looking at these issues. And I choose the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights as for one uh, a very important reason in the United States, and that is that the United States is a signatory and has actually ratified this human rights treaty. Uh, the United States has not ratified the uh, Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, um, but the ICCPR, as it's referred to, does in fact deal with the issue of discrimination against women head on. But before I dive into that, what I want to talk about, since I'm talking about law, is I want to talk about what are some of the institutional relationships that are involved in law. And this diagram, I think, uh, shows the complexity of a post-conflict environment and what you're looking at. Um, if you look at the top layer, what we're talking about is a variety of human capital. That can be the citizenry, the government employees, the NGO uh, community, the private sector. And then you have these relationships. How, did, how does this human capital work with the institutions of government? Um, and I divided that up into sort of roughly what we would think of as the three branches of government. But as you know, not, it's not one size fits all. Every jurisdiction has its own uh, approaches to this. For example, dispute resolution institutions can be formal courts as we know them, or they could be traditional uh, tribal structures that might be taking a, a lead role in solving disputes. And then as we go down in the, the diagram, we look at what are some of the common intervention categories. When we as uh, peacemakers go abroad, what are the types of things that we try to do? Uh, we try to encourage public participation frequently, build up institutions, create access to information, and increase accountability. A lot of these things you've heard in recent speeches about what we're going to be doing in Afghanistan and, and the period going forward. And then there's sort of 
what are the project elements that we, we employ for that. There's mentoring, training, equipment, um, and a number of the practical examples that my colleagues have shared. So what I'm suggesting is that when we look at this complicated situation, we look at it with a human rights lens, and we sort of test whether our interventions and our approaches uh, to these different things are consistent with what are these widely accepted principles that supposedly motivated us being there in the first place and should be guiding us in how we conduct ourselves. Um, I'm going to divide up the different rights and repackage them in the ICCPR, and these are the categories I'm going to use. And these categories were not chosen at random. Uh, the rule of law department here at USIP has been doing some research and it's been preparing a handbook in connection with the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, uh, which will hopefully operationalize some of the principles I'm about to talk about in further detail. And these are the groups uh, that they broke the, uh, the rights into. And I'm going to try to run through these very quickly. And of course, in the question and answer period, you know, feel free to bombard me if this uh, sounds too, again, mystifying. I'd like to start, though, with Article 3, because that's at the very beginning of the ICCPR. And it sets up, and that's the language of Article 3 up there. It's, it's not ambiguous. I mean, it basically says that men and women should enjoy equal rights to all the rights in the covenant. And I think it's up there not by accident, but by negotiation and forethought. And what we should be doing is thinking about how that applies to all the other civil and political rights that are contained in the document. So we, let's take Article 16 as the next one, the right to legal personality. Well, we all think we're born, uh, we immediately have our legal personality at birth, but that's not really the end of the story. Look at the northern half of Cote d'Ivoire. The Malians and the Burkinabi who occupy that, even if they were born there, don't necessarily have Ivoirian citizenship, or, Ivar, or they're not even recognized as being legal entities in the north part of Cote d'Ivoire. So what are the consequences of that? Well, if you're a woman, can you access social services? You don't have an ID card. You're, you can't vote. You're basically voiceless. And so if we really take that right to legal personality seriously, and we think about it in a gender-inclusive way, programs should be in place when it comes to registering the people in the, in the northern part of Cote d'Ivoire to make sure that women are included in that process. Same obviously goes with Article 25, the right to vote, petition, participate in government. I mean, if we are looking at these and taking these seriously, the Ivoirian example is you know, obviously applicable here as well. If you don't have an ID card, you know, you don't have a voter registration card, not only are you cut off from social services, but you're not going to be participating in the government structures. You're not going to be uh, involved in the political process generally. Um, in most post conflict environments, uh, public safety and criminality are pretty rampant. And the ICCPR, I picked two of the provisions which I think, I think are obvious and extremely important. First is the right to life. Uh, and I don't mean this in the rather controversial way that that is used in the United States political dialogue, but in the more just nuts and bolts, you know, plain meaning of the phrase. But what I think is interesting and what a lot of people don't realize is that the right to life is not just um, a situation of the government shouldn't be killing its people or should be taking care of its people. It's also taking care of the relationships between people. And one thing that these rights um, frequently in bed are what I call vertical or horizontal protections, widely accepted terms. And that means that I also have to, I have if, as a peacekeeper and as a member of state institutions, I have an obligation to not only restrain my forces in the way they behave towards the citizenry, but how the citizens behave towards each other. So it, it is not an acceptable answer to say men can treat women uh, with brutality and kill them honor killings, things like that. These are just not within the realm of these widely agreed to principles. But many people don't think of it in those horizontal terms. Same goes with the right to privacy. Um, it's not just a question of does the police come knocking at your door at 2 in the morning and ask to search your, your house for weaponry with no notice and, 
and no sense of restraint. It's also, are your neighbors doing that? Uh, so when we as peacekeepers, and sometimes you see there have been some uh, really tragic cases where peacekeepers have not intervened, and we all know what some of those examples are, while local forces uh, went at each other's throats. If we were really serious about honoring these, these principles, um, both on the right to life and the right to privacy, we would have a different policy in those circumstances. The issue of vulnerable groups. Women are obviously a number one vulnerable group. And I, I reiterate Article 3 here, but I think it's important to think of it doesn't just you know, happen in terms of uh, pronouncements about equal rights. When it comes to how they're treated as detainees, uh, or as aliens, for example, uh, if they are not given a right to legal uh, personality or if they are uh, refugees, how are they treated? Of course, the right to marry. In some cases, forced marriage is a very common practice. A woman doesn't have that right to choose. Um, and uh, depending upon uh, you know, the communities or how fragmented a post-conflict environment might be, uh, there might be certain minority rights, and in fr many cases, the male population may be decimated, and so the recognition of those minority rights may be particularly important to women. There's new terminology out there in the legal development and rule of law promotion world, and it, it talks about legal empowerment, and it frequently focuses on the role of civil society. In many, many cases, women are the most active members in civil society, and and there's at least four rights in the ICCPR that are really designed to protect and empower women in that sense. So of course, just the right to freedom of thought and belief, but there's also the right to then go out and express that in written form, radio, television, et cetera, and then to come together as women and talk about those issues and then to actually form those organizations. And if all of these things are present, one would have an enabling environment that not only includes women, but allows women to create some of the institutional stability uh, that Jackie referred to and really contribute to the lasting peace. Because not only are they representing women's issues, but they're actually creating the entire infrastructure and supporting that for a vibrant civil society, which benefits all. Um, in the terms of, you know, when you're rebuilding a legal system and you're putting things together, the covenant also gives some guidelines. And the first is to bring these principles out of the clouds and bring them down to the earth. And it, they talk about not only do you put it in your constitution, but you put it in your laws, you put it in your regulations, and then you put remedies in place so that when these things are actually violated, uh, women have a place to go to, to seek redress. Um, and sometimes that requires extra measures. Um, you know, as you know, my uh, colleagues have talked about uh, women interpreters. Think of, just think about that topic in the case of the justice institutions. Bringing them into a justice institution itself may be a huge challenge. The justice system may have to be brought to them. Uh, there's many different ways of sort of thinking about this. And once they have a remedy, how do they enforce it? Um, and in many cases, for example, uh, uh, a woman may not have, while well, they may on the books have rights to property, if their husband has been killed, they may not have any representation that can actually go to the state institution and actually, for example, secure clear title to farmland, whatever it is. Um, then there's the question, and this is one which uh, I think is not well looked at by our own international forces and peacekeepers, and that is, a lot of restrictions on these rights are justified based upon the emergency circumstances. We have to do this because there's chaos. But the, the covenant actually gives some guidelines, and it says the least restrictive measures, and certain rights cannot be strict, restricted, for example, the right to life, um, but it says the re least restrictive guidelines should apply and they should be removed as soon as possible. And if we had that lens towards a lot of the things that we see going on right now in a peacekeeping environment, we might see a revision of practices that are counterproductive. At least we would have that review process institutionalized. Um, I'm taking policing out for a little bit more detail to show how one, one particular unit of the post-conflict environment 
can involve a whole bunch of rights. And if you look at the list up here, of course, it's right to life, but it's also, you know, freedom of movement. Um, in some cases, and this, you know, may seem like a, a rather obscure article, but our Article 11 talks about you can't put someone in jail because they didn't fulfill a contract. Well, if you were to go and analyze why a lot of these people are in detention, there are probably a lot of civil disputes where local important people have said, this guy didn't pay me X or did that, so he's really a thief. And they're converting civil disputes into criminal disputes and putting people in jail. And if the police were educated on what these principles were, they might act with a, a bit more temperament and measure before um, becoming embroiled in things that they shouldn't. The other thing that I wanted to illustrate by taking police is police is one example, but there's the ICCPR has many others like this, where those general principles we've been talking about so far have been actually elaborated painstakingly by the United Nations and, and subordinate bodies. And there's at least three different uh, publications that go into great detail about how to operationalize those principles that I was just talking about. So we've got this huge body of literature. There's been this huge investment on making these principles work. Um, and I suggest that um, it's time for the policymakers, you know, both in New York and Washington and, and Brussels, to actually put more emphasis on operationalizing those. And Article 14 uh, is a laundry list of protections. And you can look through there, and uh, you can imagine how many of those are actually honored in a lot of the post-conflict environment. And particularly, um, if you think about these things in terms of uh, a gender-inclusive strategy, there's many things in here that, that could be problematic, depending on the cultural context. And the ICCPR is not an inflexible, imperialistic, hege hegemonic instrument. It can be tailored to those local cultural circumstances. What's important is, in most jurisdictions, wide, wide majority, not only does that post-conflict nation, at least on paper, say they support these principles, but all the peacekeepers who show up as well. And in many times, the ICCPR is actually referred to uh, and UN Security Council resolutions. Um, detention uh, is one which I think a lot of people don't realize how huge a problem that is. And the principles here are again elaborated by other UN documents. But in many cases, for example, with women, detention is a much more uh, significant problem than I think uh, is at first blush. And I'm not talking just about women being detained, although I'm sure some of you know the example of when they actually decided to put together a prison registry at the women's prison in Kabul, the Policharki women's prison. They found a hundred women were in there who had actually finished their term or had never been charged with anything. Um, imagine the impact that that had on the families and the financial units that they were associated with. And that's all because, and in my humble opinion, these rights regarding uh, uh, detainee rights weren't really respected. They weren't taken seriously. If you're not keeping a register of who it is you, you're detaining that's accurate, um, I think you've just flunked the basic precept. Um, and the other thing, and I've seen this myself, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, is many of the men who are in detention are the breadwinners, and the prison themselves they can't feed these people. And so the women have to have access to some of these rights just to keep their breadwinner alive. They're bringing food to them on a daily basis. And if these rights and principles are not respected, at least to some significant degree, their entire, uh, even if it's just a short stay in prison, um, their entire life could be at stake. They could lose their breadwinner and their position in society just because they can't get access. Um, with that, I'd like to, to close with one of my favorite quotes from someone who is on the Human Rights Committee, which is the, and not to be confused with some of the other organs out there in the UN, the Human Rights Committee is a body that specifically focuses on enforcing the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it's one by a, a, a famous member who's, who's since left the committee. And she says, if domestic courts, legal practitioners, and human rights advocates were fully aware of the obligations that their states have undertaken, 
and how those obligations are interpreted and applied by independent monitoring bodies, they might be, well be able to do more to press for effective implementation and to ensure the application of laws and policies was as far as possible consistent with treaty obligations. And I think that's, uh, that sums up my thesis uh, pretty concisely. You know, we've got to talk, we ought to start walking that, and, and we can do it in a way, I think, that uh, empowers women and at the same time empowers the state institutions uh, that will benefit everyone. So I hope that was reasonably clear, and I look forward to the questions in case it wasn't. Thanks, Scott. We often hear that, you know, culture stands in the way of uh, various third parties to engage women. These principles are universally agreed upon. They're ratified by most countries. And so they can help us give, I guess, get, have tools to reframe the issue um, and can help us uh, engage women uh, not from a, not from a um, you know, equality um, uh, argument necessarily, if that doesn't work, but from a, a, a rights argument that can actually help. So sometimes we need to educate uh, the local actors um, with whom we work, and this, these are tools that can really help to, to do that and uh, to, kind of, again, reframe the issue um, away from the gender issue. Okay, that can be helpful. All right, so thank you so much for these three great presentations. Uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, come to the mic microphone and ask your questions. Also, there's tea, coffee, and uh, water outside. If you need to uh, go get uh, a refreshment, please go ahead and do that. Um, so. If anybody has uh, a question, please come up to the microphone and uh, we'll take questions, I think, uh, one at a time for now. Uh, and uh, you can address it to a particular panel member or uh, to all three of them or as you wish. Go ahead. Oh, do you want to come to the microphone to stand to the, so that we can hear you? Please just go ahead and <coughs> form a, a line or however you wish. <clears throat> Not this one over here. Uh, hello, my name is Larissa Breton. I'm principal at Full Circle Communications. I would like to thank all of you from such a heartfelt perspective for providing actionable measures that people can use and install program program programmatically and also to use when assessing programs and developing programs and requirements especially. Um, I have a, a question for you, Toby, about TCAP. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a loaded question, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> okay. There's nothing, no, I'm no ready for it here. Then. It's merely a question. Yeah. Um, I have extensive experience with the polling that went around the human terrain system from the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. and, and in particular, uh, Jackie, Jacqueline, the stuff you talked about when you have wins, it's important to say this is a win. It is a qualitative measure, and we're going to say it. It is. It exists. However, with respect to TCOP and the, 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 the polling, the random sample stuff, the mm -hmm. KISH stuff that went on with HTS, what's the best way in your mind to move forward to try to get at those qualitative measures in a quantitative sense so that we can have a better discussion with policymakers and with military to help them understand ways forward? If that I, th I think I think I understand. Um, I mean, what, so for those um, who don't know, TCAF uh, is uh, a way to distill qualitative assessment information into a uh, quantifiable database to then inform um, programmatic uh, decisions by whoever the, the implementer is. Um, and I think what um, what we are this has always been um, a foundation of the tool is to not um, sacrifice rich qualitative information for the sake of developing a nice clean you know attractive database but that, that you're really taking the time for you know deeper interaction with uh, you know individuals as you're really trying to understand the root causes of instability and to you know, to make sure that that information it becomes part of the, the program design. So not just you input the information to the database and then it floats up, you never see it again, but that we really, one, uh, one specific recommendation that we have made, now whether it's implemented consistently is another question, but that the individual who was actually involved in the, the interviewing and the assessment then continues to be involved in program design in that particular area. So that you're connecting the individuals who have who, who 
who are more connected to the, the qualitative information to then continue throughout the, the process of, of the program design. So that's a one specific recommendation because we don't want, um, you know, it's like a game of telephone that by the time, you know, you started out with this wonderful, nice, rich report of qualitative information, you end up with one line on an Excel spreadsheet with one word that's the summary of that where, where we recognize that that, um, that, that, can, that, that, that that's not um, correct um, and that we're trying to facilitate, you know, the connection of that deeper, richer information with the program design. So we're trying. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other comments? Go ahead, Hi. Please. My name is Ruth Sear, and I have a question for Scott. Um, in terms of a human rights framework, um, can you give an example where an appeal to the elements of the Human Rights Covenant has worked practically in shifting the agenda in a, you know, in a local environment? Um, well, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a leap and say that, uh, hold this up for show and tell, you probably can't see this. Um, what I did was uh, I tried to uh, walk my own talk and go out <laughs> into Macedonia after there was the conflagration, you know, uh, around 2003, 4, and there was the Ulfred Framework Agreement that was supposed to um, basically reduce tensions in the environment and, uh, and do that by having a more inclusive approach for the Albanian minority as well as the Turkish minority vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Macedonian uh, population. And what I did was I took these standards and I developed an assessment tool and a questionnaire and a methodology and I went out with the team and we checked up on how well the Awkward Framework Agreement was living up to uh, instilling these equal rights that it was supposed to. And then we presented the government through, presented the results to the government. The government <coughs> participated in parts of it, but we did it through quiet channels and we also did it with um, uh, delivering it to other major donors, such as, of course, USAID, the European Union. And uh, while I can't claim credit, uh, I can say that the subsequent programming, for example, just to, to draw one, on the way they approached the civil service and the police, um, was they actually built into the programming a certain inclusive, uh, what I would say, rights-based approaches, and uh, and they followed that through. Uh, it was not just in the program design, in the actual police academy uh, and, and in the civil service, the way they re restructured that. And uh, so I would say that that, that is an, an, a good example of a concrete success. Um, I think probably at a certain point in time, the implementers didn't realize what they were working on and that they were really so rights-oriented. Uh, they did, of course, when they were handing out the books that made the citations to it, but uh, um, it reminds me of something Toby just said in answer to the previous question. It's important to have the people who are involved in the assessment and, and design follow through on the project to keep uh, reinvigorating that. And so uh, I, I would probably say it's a qualified success. I don't know if they're still all sitting around with a copy of the ICCPR <laughs> in their nightstand. <laughs> Let me weave in one uh, comment that we got from um, one of the women that are watching the, the webcast. And I should say, I guess we, we got a call um, saying that uh, I should tell uh, whoever's watching uh, what the email is again, remind them. So it's gender at usip.org, where you can send an email. But let me just read this um, interesting comment, um, and then we'll move over to, to questions again. It's, it says, hi, this is Samia Ahmed from Sudan. First, we would like to thank uh, the Institute for Inclusive Security and USIP. It is really great to be part of this session while it is happening. It is really empowering. We hope this will continue. Jackie gave examples of positive engagement for women. To add to this, these women can also contribute well in security policies in our context like Sudan. The vis visibility of women in the security sectors as policymakers is badly needed as the image right now is for women at implementing roles like in police, security, and intelligence, usually as implementing officers. Availing opportunities and skills for women to be able to promote their skills in the area of security work and take part in designing of policies and practice 
and utilize opportunities like security, security arrangements in peace agreements, etc. When we talk about women engagement in security, we also need to take into consideration the conditions of women who participate in rebel movements or armies and often in DDR programs. The nature of their participation is seen and dealt with as providers of food and stuff while most of them play similar roles as men and often, often suffering more because of their gender during their struggle. My questions, what are the techniques and approaches used in the North and Western world to build links between women in the security sectors and the general population? Or is it not a big issue and not needed? Are women well, or, well recognized in their contexts apart from the missions they get sent to abroad? And when these women participate in the missions abroad, are they sent to adhere to examples, uh, to adhere, sorry, for example, to 1325, uh, referring to the UN resolution, or is it just a military police order? And do they realize the kind of messages their presence bring, brings in countries like ours? She just has one more comment and then we'll get to the questions. Apart from the inclusion of women in the formal security sector uh, structures, why we still don't see investments of inclusion of women in the informal structures like community initiatives, protection measures and programs led and supported by peacekeeping missions, UN and international community, although there is a global experience that points out to the importance of this. Thank you and best wishes. Thank you, Samia, and we'll try to address your questions. Does somebody want to go first? Sure. Um, that's great, first of all, uh, that they contributed. I mean, just to highlight what's happening, we have women in Sudan who are watching what's going on and actually sending in comments. So this is, this really highlights, I think, what um, I made in my opening comments that there, I mean, there's obviously incredible capacity there to contribute to these issues. And I'm, I'm really grateful to USIP for helping make uh, those voices heard. Uh, Samia made, obviously, a number of great points. Um, to address some of the questions, um, are women well recognized? Uh, I think she was referring to a number of, of maybe Western or Northern, as she called it, militaries. Uh, we work a lot with women in um, NATO forces and elsewhere I work. I was in uh, Brussels earlier this year speaking with the Committee of Women in NATO Forces. And I think there's always a struggle of women in security forces don't want to be seen, of course, as dealing explicitly with what they would consider women's issues. So, you know, a number of the points I made uh, related to women being more uh, better positioned in many ways to deal with issues of sexual violence and others, uh, women in security forces will be the very first to tell you that they want to be police officers or they want to be Marines, they want to be um, members of elite and security forces, they don't want to be serving only women and dealing with only women's issues. So uh, I would say that women in these security forces and men who are working with them really have an obligation to treat them as professionals first and foremost and to figure out ways that men can, that they can first of all access their um, unique skills but also take them very seriously um, and as professionals. Um, one of the, the highlights in, of international security uh, and women's participation relates to the situation of Liberia and General Khmer referenced it in the remarks that are available outside. I really hope you'll take a copy, he makes excellent points in them. Um, and he noted that in India and in Liberia, or India sent to Liberia an all women's uh, formed police unit. So they sent, I think, about 125 at a time women police officers. And, you know, they, they did their jobs extremely professionally and they did a great job. But one of the impacts of them being there was just the visibility of women professional security officers among the Liberian population. And they did a number of things uh, to actually interact with the community. So as Toby mentioned, they were going to speak at high schools and at trade um, associations. And they were going to speak to young women and provide for them uh, this role model of women who were not working explicitly on women's issues. They were not doing the logistics um, that Samia mentioned a lot of women end up doing. And the recruitment of local Liberian women to the Liberian um, police force, or the Li Liberian uh, National Police following that, increased by three 300%. So the increase of Liberian women applying to be Liberian National Police officers increased by 300% following this deployment. So I would just say that, um, you know, I think we all have to be careful in identifying the unique and specific contributions that women make and saying that those are not their, their sole skills uh, and that women very much want to be taken seriously in all forms, but um, 
but yeah, the kinds of messages and, and role models that they provide are, are really powerful. Good. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Rogers? No? Okay, we may come back to this issue. It's a very interesting issue. We're trying to draw parallels. You know, are there any lessons that we can learn from the way the West, uh, you know, and donor countries are trying to, you know, uh, set an example? Or do, have, do they have answers um, in terms of how, you know, are women being linked to, um, to security issues um, um, and as security providing officials and they're linked to the general population? It's very interesting. Can I, sorry, make one other final point? Um, just I realized I didn't address the issue of, of links between women in the security sector here in the general population. Um, I was in Kyrgyzstan in November and had the chance to have a really amazing interaction with a group of uh, what they called community police advisors. And so the Organization of Security and Economic Cooperation, the OSCE, was working with uh, national, Kyrgyz National Police. And they had this incredible model of community interaction. And what it was was they supported the establishment of these community advisory board, community police advisory boards uh, around Bishkek, so the capital of Kyrgyzstan. And I had this amazing opportunity to go there. Uh, and what I realized was it was groups of people of really just interested and committed citizens who had a liaison officer from the uh, Kyrgyz National Police. And they just talked regularly about security issues. So there was a women's committee. Uh, they created databases of at-risk families and um, families that had issues of domestic violence. They talked about vulnerable people in their communities. And one of the things that the police did to encourage <laughs> this is they had regular open houses uh, where people from the community could come and just have a look at the way uh, the at the police station effectively, and they could bring kids there and look at the jails and say, "So you know, this is where you might be detained uh, in future if if you break the law. This is how we work. This is where we collect information." It was just a really powerful model of the fact that this is a community police service, not a police force, as Toby was talking about. And they really took seriously this fact. And the majority of the people on their community police advisory groups were women. And so I thought it was a real model of how to actually engage women in these issues. And they did that by making themselves, first of all, appear to be much less threatening, and then physically being out there in their communities. So. Absolutely. I just wanted to say the very fact that Sami is asking this question about what can be learned from other parts of the world just really speaks to the critical need for um, exchange of information and, and trying to to um, to share lessons learned to create um, you know partnerships and opportunities for learning between women who are in the security sector um, both within their countries and, and and across different environments. It's something that um, Inclusive Security actually spent a little bit of time facilitating and trying to connect um, female Liberian police officers with Canadian uh, female police officers. Jackie is Canadian. Um, and, uh, and, and that is a really, really exciting model that, um, that we would um, advocate for those of you in the audience who are involved in to, to try to replicate in other areas. Thank you. OK, thanks for your patience. We'll move to question in the room. Hi, my name is Liz Panarelli. I work here at USIP, and my question is about gender disaggregated data. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel that it's important for um, increasing attention to an inclusion of women in all processes, but coming from a university and perhaps idealistic context, um, where there are movements to move gender beyond the binary of men and women. I'm wondering about, and maybe from a human rights perspective or in cultures where that binary isn't applicable, and here in the United States, how to collect gender dis disaggregated data um, in a way that is open and inclusionary to all genders. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, I will jump in on that. From a, a, a rights perspective, I think that's it's a crucial point. And the data collection in many of the environments we work in, at least from a formal perspective, is uh, either non-existent or chaotic or struggling at best. And so you, it's really hard to get uh, a clear picture. Um, sometimes there, even in a case where they do have potentially the data collection, though, you have what I would call mental roadblocks. I want to give one example. There was a a country that will remain nameless where I was working on some domestic violence legislation, taking a rights-based approach. Um, there was no opposition to us working on that. There was no cultural resistance. But there was also no perceived need because, of course, 
they didn't have domestic violence in this country because, and they cited, uh, their data was that there was not a single situation where it had been reported at one of their hospital emergency rooms. So it just wasn't an issue. It's very kind of me to offer to talk <laughs> about that with them, but they just didn't have that problem. Well, we all know that that's a ridiculous claim because uh, domestic violence occurs everywhere. But I think one of the challenges is to, in some cases, just educate uh, and use different strategies to get people into the data collection mode. Because uh, I think, you, you're, Liz, you're right on. I mean, it's not being collected adequately uh, because it would tell many different stories. Once you have that data set, there's a lot of different aspects, at least from a rights perspective, you can learn about. And it's not just data about you know, coming into emergency rooms or uh, hospitals, but look at the state budget. How much is allocated to things that might affect uh, various genders? Um, do they have any set-asides? Is there a ministry of you know, women's issues or things like that? And so I think it's a very spot-on question. Unfortunately, I think my overall answer is we're not doing a very good job yet. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is, thank you very much. This has been really great, especially how, I, like people have said, actionable a lot of these items are. Uh, I'm, my name is Elena Tanzi, and I'm a member of the Women International Security Network, and uh, I'm going to ask a little bit of a selfish question. Uh, can you recommend agencies or security groups that are currently pushing to hire women, since <laughs> I and several other people I know uh, are looking for jobs? And if you can't answer that specifically, maybe advice on your own experiences in this sector and how to improve that uh, climb. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. We can go back to it if you want to think about it. Yeah, I think I want to think about it. Okay, we'll, we'll address that. We'll just think about it a bit. Hi, I'm Kimberly King. I'm with the Alliance for Peace Building. And a couple of comments and questions. First, um, Scott, when you were talking about the different issues, in, especially in detainees, I was just in a meeting um, where I think it was highlighted even more for me um, in the country of Nigeria, and we were looking at reforms there. And the statistics on how long um, folks were detained, especially the women, for one, two, and three and more years before they even are heard or listed. And um, I wondered about, I think you made a reference to that part of the process, but I wanted to be able to find it more in your outline and also to ask if this outline is available online or some way we can get the, because there was a lot of detail. It was. Uh, I apologize for that and the speed with which I went through it. I'd be <laughs> glad to share it with you and glad to have further discussions. And you're spot on with your question. Um, the, the intake process is, and actually getting that person registered is so crucial because in most legal situations that's when certain protections are supposed to attach. And what they do, uh, and, I, I, and actually in one country where I was working on this, uh, I won't name it, but they would move uh, women and men right before they had to register them to another location mm -hmm. and then they get to start over before they had to register it. Mm -hmm. so, it's a very pernicious uh, problem, and um, and you're spot on to identify that. And Nigeria is a terrible case too. Right. Well, we're going into some focused discussions on that. So I think the assessment tools within the security sector and peace building in the larger umbrella of that about um, how we're able to identify what is a good gender training and what isn't. And any thoughts you have about that? and we'd like to support the development of that if it doesn't exist. Thanks. Thank you. Did you want to address it? Um, great, first of all, thank you uh, for your interest and commitment to that. I found very little in terms of assessment tools uh, on eff assessing the effectiveness of training on gender. In fact, I don't think I've ever actually seen anything uh, that's really good. We, um, we've tried to you know, we do surveys and, and get evaluation forms um, as we deliver training. We always try to do a baseline assessment. So, you know, asking general questions at the beginning of a training uh, um, that get to people's sort of 
perceptions, I think, is the biggest issue related to gender training. So, you know, do you think a woman could be the Minister of the Interior, for example? Um, you know, do you think a woman should be a battalion commander? Things that, that don't necessarily talk about skills, but that talk about perceptions at the beginning, and then really assessing afterwards, has that changed? So I think we've found that to be one of the best ways to assess whether or not training like this has been effective. But as far as a standardized tool, I really have not come across anything um, that's effective. Maybe Nadia has, has got different experience on that, but I would say that's a, a big issue. Um, and just if I can, I was just thinking about the previous two questions. Do you mind if I um, please go ahead and, and briefly talk about that? Liz, your question about uh, gender desegregated data. Um, I don't think we've addressed the sort of non-binary function of that, but I think the biggest way to capture maybe what you're getting at is, is to actually start measuring, collecting data related to specific roles. Because I think what we find, especially post-conflict, is that roles change. You know, women um, are now put in positions of being primary breadwinners, as Scott was saying. Um, men are also fulfilling different roles. And I think the way that you actually start um, piecing apart, or taking apart the different roles and sort of more gendered issues of conflict are to actually collecting uh, gender desegregated data in places where you think it doesn't matter. So, you know, how many women versus how many men showed up uh, for training on specific issues? How many women versus how many men participated um, or signed up for different social programs, et cetera? And I think once you start getting that, you can start getting some data on the different roles that people are fulfilling um, post conflict in particular, and that gives some more information um, related to, I hope, what you're getting at. And uh, secondly, Elena, your question about. Um, currently pushing to hire, this is an easy answer, but police and military are always looking to hire uh, and recruit women. And I think it's something that people don't think about enough, and I wish I'd thought about it um, as, a, as a younger woman of actually joining the police. Um, and you know, I still think about it now. It's, it's something that I think a lot of young women in particular don't consider as a career option, and I think we absolutely should. It goes back to these issues of really not, you know, I had no concept of what police officers could or should do uh, when I was considering career paths. And I think if I really did have an accurate assessment of that, I might have chosen to go into one of those fields. And, and um, I think we can't underestimate the importance of women considering armed um, and uniformed services as career options these days, because it really is the best way, I think, to, to infiltrate these issues from the inside. So easy answer, but true, I hope. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point about the um, the issue of, of improving uh, training. And I think not it's not only just improving the assessment so that we actually do um, have, uh, you know, some agreement on what does a successful gender training look like, but to, to think about um, what you can do at the outset as well. Something that USAID has been trying to improve is actually defining competencies for its staff members more specifically so that you don't have a vague competency like understand gender, mm -hmm. but that you're really at the that at that beginning first step, you know, cataloging exactly what it is from the most practical standpoint possible, whether it is, you know, under, you know, uh, you know, competency around collecting gender disaggregated data, um, evaluating, you know, program proposals from a gender perspective, you know, if it's, you know, for contracting, um, you know, specific, uh, you know, more, uh, more tactical kinds of skills around, uh, you know, dialoguing with women, but, but to, to think about what can be done um, to increase the quality of training at that, that first stage before the trainings are even developed. I would add, if I can, my first experience with training on this issue was at the UN mission in Sudan, and I was really engaged and interested in this, and so I went to this training, and it was the one hour on gender that happens in the induc induction training, so all new people to the mission uh, partake in this training, and it was uh, about 45 minutes, um, the definition of gender. So it, what is sex, what is gender? Incredibly theoretical things that I was confused about by the end, actually, um, following this 45 minute discussion. And then 15 minutes on uh, the UN's policy of sexual exploitation. So 15 minutes on the fact that you will be sent home and you will be severely disciplined, basically if you talk to a woman, was the key takeaway message. So. And it was me, a couple other civilians, and about 40 Nepalese peacekeepers sitting in this training. And by the end, I was far more confused than I was in the beginning. And it, it, had, it left me with this Kimberly's question about what exactly was the goal of that training? You know, what competencies did they expect anyone to come away with? Because it was partly about awareness, but there was absolutely no skills 
angle to it whatsoever. So totally agree that the only way training is going to improve is if we start identifying what are these specific outcomes that we want to have uh, come from the training itself. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to add, um, I, I teach in the Academy for International Conflict Management and Peace Building here at USIP. And um, I've been doing, including a gender session in my courses and, and um, encouraging and helping my colleagues to develop their own sessions in their courses. And I would urge people to remember that, you know, adult learning principles apply all everywhere. Um, and the very first principle is don't lecture for 40 hours um, <laughs> and get people engaged and thinking and reflecting themselves about some of these issues. Um, that's the very first thing. And I would like to suggest that, you know, when we're talking about interactive, uh, you know, going to the interactive route when we're educating and training, as opposed to, you know, lecturing and talking about, you know, uh, you know, what's the resolution, you know, what, you know, what's the mission, uh, what can you do, what can you not do. I call that induction training. That's what the UN calls it. It's induction training. It's how to be a good mission participant. But then we need to be, you know, training people on how to make better decisions, how to be aware of various uh, issues that they should be aware of when they're developing programs or making particular decisions. Um, so interactive sessions are very, very uh, useful and helpful and teach uh, quite a bit. Uh, to adults, uh, and I would like to point to the decaf tool that's been uh, put out, a variety of um, exercises uh, that now, there, I think there are about 12 of them. Um, the, uh, it's a training resource uh, put out by decaf uh, that was edited by a variety of uh, people in a variety of institutions, including USIP. Four of us um, here at USIP were part of the editing um, board for, for these exercises, and there's just a, a tool um, I guess a, a booklet, a handbook full of exercises that you can use in training. Uh, I, I can share more details um, uh, of that tool with you, but it's very useful. Uh, it's, there are a variety of exercises in building awareness. There are a variety of exercises in how you engage uh, women in, a particular, in the justice, justice sector reform and security sector reform and all the way to social well-being issues like health, education, and things like that. So I would urge people to think about interactive uh, sessions and training, getting people to not just listen to rules and regulations and principles um, and, and what to do and what not to do, but really get people to think themselves, talk amongst themselves in small groups, and really wrestle with some of the issues on the how-to sort of approaches. Um, I would also say that it's important when we're doing training to do a needs assessment to understand what our audience, you know, especially when we're talking about gender issues, where is our audience? What are they convinced of? What do they n need to be convinced of? What are they aware of? What do we need to make them aware of? Um, so it's dangerous to teach people what they already know. I mean, it's a waste of time and resources, but it's also dangerous to go and, and provide them how-tos when they're not necessarily convinced that women can make a, a difference, for example. So we need to really make a needs assessment, understand our audience, and tailor our training to, to the needs of the audience and to the work that they will be doing. That's always all pretty useful. So, um, and then I also wanted to bring up an issue that's always about, uh, about gender, going back to, um, you know, w recruiting women in, in, in security forces. Um, here in the, U in the West, in the U.S., as in places in post-conflict environments uh, or conflict zones, we have to think about work-life balance. We have to think about women's issues. Uh, taking care of children, taking care of elders in the home, taking, you know, transportation issues, all these kinds of things. We need to be thinking about those. They are obstacles for women to get into um, some of these, these jobs that are, uh, you know, less traditional than, than the ones that women have been uh, going to. So those are the comments. And about training, I'm happy to talk um, offline afterwards about some of these, these tools because they're, I've used them and they're really, really useful. Could I just oh, make yes, a little comment on that? Sorry. Um, I just want to make a little short advertisement that's related to that and build on what Jackie mentioned in her <coughs> remarks about NPRAL, the International Network for the Promotion of Rule of Law. If you're interested in rights based security sector reform, you know, uh, justice institutions reform, I would encourage you to go to NPRAL.org and uh, sign up uh, and pose some of these issues because one of the things is that since you know, maybe there's not a, a great answer right now for how you assess the eff eff efficacy of some gender training initiatives, but our goal with NPRAL is to create a virtual network that will, you know, allow us to have sort of a, what would you 
you say, longitudinal approach. So over time, as people learn about these things or come up with things, they post it, share it. And together, you know, we as a community can then critique and suggest and refine some of these tools. Uh, and we don't all have to be sitting in the same room to do it, so. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, we've been standing there for a while. <laughs> My name is Elisa Turo, and I work at the State Department's Humanitarian Information Unit. I want to thank all of you for your very helpful um, words of advice and comments and suggestions. Um, my question, uh, at the Humanitarian Information Unit, I'm working on research on conflict-related sexual violence and rape. Um, and one of the things I would like to hear your take on is when women are included in the security sector, what are some of the tangible impacts on uh, sexual violence and rape? Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, first of all, I think not everyone is aware that the UN actually has been working on some very important uh, frameworks related to sexual violence lately. So, uh, you know, UN Security Res Council Resolution 1325 was passed about 10 years ago. And then in the last, I think, year and a half, there have been three new resolutions, uh, some very specifically related to sexual violence, including uh, 1820, which really went a long way to, I think, bringing the international community, uh, first of all, in realizing that sexual violence is a tactic of war and is a destabilizing force. So I think just to frame, frame the answer, broadly speaking, we're starting to actually acknowledge sexual violence as, um, as a tactic of warfare, as I said, as opposed to just sort of a, a side issue that is a consequence of war, but really to, um, to acknowledge it as really integral to the strategies for, for fighting war, first of all. So um, your question was related to the impact of women in the security sector and addressing those issues. There are a number of, of answers and I think of, of impacts that they make. First of all, and General Khmer mentions this in his remarks, women are just far more likely to tell another woman uh, when they experience sexual violence. So as you can imagine, it's just incredibly difficult for a woman in a community who's been a victim of sexual violence to go to a, mem a male member of a security force who often um, these security forces have been perpetrating uh, conflict and, and have been active members of this conflict in their communities to then go to them and say, I, I experienced sexual violence. So I think at its base level, women are just more comfortable talking about these issues with other women. Um, General Khmer mentioned that sexual violence is now the largest reported crime to the Liberian National Police. And I think you would not see that if you didn't have an emphasis on having not just women officers, but women officers who are actually out in the communities or, you know, don't force a woman to walk into headquarters uh, and, you know, talk to the clerk at the front desk, but people who, as Toby mentioned, they've developed relationships with and developed trust with, you really start to get that information. And secondly, I think there's some emerging data to show that the behavior of men changes when there is a critical mass of women in any organization, and it holds true for uh, men and women in the security sector. So uh, some of this is based on research of U.S. police services that when there's a critical mass, and usually we say that's about 30 percent women, the behavior of men changes. And I think it really is, it will become a truism that sexual violence perpetrated yeah. by security forces uh, will decrease as there become more and more women uh, involved. And, you know, for a number of, I guess, sociological reasons that um, I haven't studied and don't understand, but I really think it's it's these kind of social pressures are one of the biggest ways to actually decrease sexual violence and sexual exploitation perpetrated by security forces. I'd like, I'd like to um, add to, I think Jackie did a, a great summary introducing what some of the new developments are. I, I would add a, one cautionary note, and that is while we've finally gotten to the point where we acknowledge rape as an instrument of war, and, and that's a huge step forward and long overdue, it actually is not the same instrument in each environment. So the impact of mass rape in one culture in one country might have to have a different response. I think there are some general takeaways. I know having worked in some mass atrocities documentation projects in different locales in the past, and one of the things is, is to, to create a safe space for women to talk. Jackie's spot on. They're more likely to talk to women. But then there is, they don't need to tell the story 17 times. And so you, Re-traumatizing the person who's been traumatized has got to be in the foremost of any strategy programmatically that's developed. And I would also suggest that there be counseling services associated with it. So there's not only um, 
because in many cases, justice is not what they're thinking of. They're thinking about getting back to normal. And in order to encourage them to come into the process and begin to report accurately, I think it's important that they also have a tangible benefit, which in, in this case, would, I would suggest would be counseling. On, a, on another note, just on that specific issue, I mentioned earlier Sierra Leone and the special courts that they set up to prosecute sexual violence. And one of the things that they tried to take very seriously was actually counseling women on potential consequences of testifying. So, you know, not just saying, come and tell your story, as Scott says 17 times to anyone who listened, isn't it awful what happened? Let's tell the world, let's get justice for you. But also really understanding, do you want to tell the story publicly? There are consequences. Um, to you as a woman in your community coming forward with this. And I think it's our responsibility as people who are supporting processes like that to, to really discuss these issues. And I think that those are things that women understand um, and will bring, are maybe more likely to bring to the fore discussions like that. Do you, are you interviewing people in a gender sensitive way and are, are you also counseling them in a gender sensitive way? So what are the gender specific impacts of you testifying uh, and making sure that people really do have all the information before they continue to, to give their story 17 different times. One other, um, one other point I wanted to raise, particularly around the um, issue of uh, reporting rapes, is not only to look at the impact of women in the security sector, but also looking at um, women in uh, the medical field. I remember being shocked um, and appalled at work that I was doing in northern Uganda to learn that I believe in all in you know f the four most um, uh, LRA affected areas in the north, there were two doctors who were actually certified to fill out the medical form um, that a woman needed to actually report a rape and that that in itself was an incredible bottleneck to, to then going um, to, a, to a police station. So to be looking um, in your research for those kinds of potential impacts um, within the um, what, what services are available in the, the health fields. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just read two comments and then we'll give you the, uh, the floor. This is a comment from um, Humara Shaheed, who is a former member of parliament and a journalist in Pakistan. She says, I believe that in the ground reality, it's not the policy shapers or policy makers that face war, or even more blatantly bleed in war. It's common people and the soldiers, and both suffer a great deal. The demons of the war remain with them. The real connection between women and people responsible for security could be very meaningful for diffusing war or the ide ideology of war, the radicalization, hatred towards clan, creed, culture, or religion. Women shape the mentality and mindsets of the children they bear and the generations they raise. Their influence is long lasting. Women are very meaningful. The reservoir, if tapped properly, can bring change in very little time. Women can build peace because they understand peace and need peace for their children and they are natural communicators and can create very effective bridges. So thank you for that comment. And one other comment, um, and then we'll go to a question in the room, from Samia uh, Nihar uh, in Sudan. Uh, she says, despite of the utmost importance of women in police and security, we need still to think how we can put gender in the center of their mind and attitude to the best of women victims of war. How can we make these important role more related to women, women's daily life, spe uh, especially in displaced and refugee camps? So some, some food for thought um, that should not be ignored. So thank you for sending in those comments. We'll get another one to read, but I think we'll go to the, to the microphone. Go ahead. Well, thanks to all of you very much. It's inspiring to have both the kind of bottom-up discussion of how we can take successes and build them into something broader, but also how we work from broad principles down to specifics. Um, I'm Melanie Greenberg. I'm co-president of Women International Security, and I also run a small foundation that works on peace building and nuclear nonproliferation. And I have two comments and a question. Um, first, for the um, people who don't know why, we, re we have a report that's about two years old on women in peace operations that I recommend to any of you interested in the subject. Also, for the person who asked about jobs, we've got a very good jobs network uh, if you want to join WISE and get some ideas. Um, the second question or comment involves window dressing and a concern that I have in police reform that it's often kind of easy to try to get your numbers up without real heft behind it. And I just give a very small example. I was in Mumbai last year, and I was struck at the airport how there seemed to be about an equal number of airport police who are men and who are women. But the women's uniform was a sari. It was khaki with epaulets. 
then I wondered, okay, so they have to run after a drug dealer, a terrorist. Are they going to be able to run in that sari? And what were they really doing? What was their purpose? So it just set those kinds of questions off in my mind. My larger question is one of leadership. And in some ways, we have a small pool to draw from. We don't have mediators, as Jackie mentioned, uh, female mediators in UN peace processes. There are very few heads of state like <coughs> Liberia that can set these processes in motion. But what can we as an international community do to build leadership either of transitional justice processes, in the military, in the peacekeeping forces? What levers can we press to create more of a social movement towards women as leaders in these processes? Thank you. Can, um, shame, first of all, <laughs> I think uh, is an answer. Um, you know, I think it's just, it's just not true that there aren't women who have the skills to do this. It's just I think we're not looking hard enough to find them and we're not prioritizing it enough. Uh, one of my favorite stories relates to, um, and again, apologies for all the Sudanese examples, but a member of parliament in Sudan that we worked with, a fabulous woman named Jenma Kumba. And the Secretary General of the UN, so Ban Ki-moon, was traveling to Khartoum to deal with the, um, a number of issues, including the crisis in Darfur. And so he gathered with him uh, a room full of prominent members of parliament, usually mo mainly heads of committees and, and, um, and you know, respected parliamentarians. So she's the only woman in this room. She's head of the Economic Affairs Committee. And she sits through uh, the Secretary General's discussion, and he talks about how important it is to have women involved in the crisis in Darfur. You know, they're, they're the majority of victims. They have incredible roles in camps and elsewhere, uh, and leadership to provide, you know, important to the reconstruction, et cetera. We really need to get them involved. So he goes on, he talks about that and a number of other issues. Then, um, you know, there are a series of questions, and finally, she finally gets called upon, and he says, yes, you know, we'd like to hear from the women of Sudan on this issue. And she says, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I really want to, you know, acknowledge how important your remarks are and tell you that I, too, am advocating for the same things, you know, within my political party, within uh, Darfur, with the rebel movements, et cetera. But I must say, uh, it would really help me a lot if you actually came here with some women on your team. And he looks around and he had, you know, not to say that he didn't have women there, but in the, in the room with him at that time, there were only men sitting around him. I mean, people aren't stupid. They get the fact that the UN and the international community and the rest of us can go and talk about the importance of women. But if we don't actually provide these external signals that, yes, we actually value this and it's important, you know, if the UN says that they can't find women to participate, you know, from this pool of the entire world, how are we expecting these Darfurian movements to, find, to have 25% women um, at the negotiation table. So I think just the symbolism of who we send on delegations, who we appoint to senior level positions, I mean, no one would advocate for appointing people who aren't qualified. We're just saying, you know, expand your search and make a point of doing it and shame people who don't, you know, just talk about it openly. I think people are very reluctant to talk about gender or women's representation because they think it's sort of unfairly singling out women or that it makes it a women's issue. And I think we just need to start talking about it and, and calling for it and, and calling out countries that don't nominate women to senior positions at the UN. You know, I work a lot of advocacy in Canada. We don't, we have great qualified women and we're not nominating them to these senior positions. And then we shame the UN for not appointing enough women. You know, there's, there's troop contributing and, and contributing country issues that we can all work on at these base levels. I, I really just think the women are there and we need to start making it more embarrassing for people when they don't, don't make a point of profiling them. I, I would just add, uh, Melanie, you, your window dressing point is a really good one. And I, I, I really like Jackie's explanation to you, Liz, about looking at data gathering in terms of roles. Because if you think about the role, you just nailed it. Can you chase down a, you know, uh, even a pickpocket in a sari? And if you begin to sort of define roles and what are the, and the sub aspects, I think you can get beyond that window dressing or at least begin having a frank discussion. I mean, obviously the optics that you know, Jackie's talking about are you know, slam dunks, but you, know, you can do a lot of head counting and make it look a lot better than it is, and I think that's your point. Yeah, thank you. Let me just read one comment and then we'll go to your your question. This is from Samia El Hashmi. Um, she uh, is an advocate and chairwoman of a women's organization working for women human, women's human rights since 1990 in Khartoum. She says, I think, it is ex I think it is extremely important to talk about this important topic because we believe that peace does not mean only not war. Peace for me as a woman is social security 
and welfare. So engaging women in security will widen the concept of peace to the soldier, in the soldier's mind and to the peacekeepers. I've prepared a working paper on the role of women in security arrangement in the Niwasha Protocol in the Sudan Peace uh, Agreement. The conclusion of the working paper that war is that war and peace issues are men-dominated issues. Women are not part of it at all. Even nothing is mentioned about women soldiers or officers. So we need to incorporate gender issues in military forces and peacekeeping forces. Thank you for your comment. It's well taken. Please. My name is Madge Kabuit. I'm a retired social worker and uh, I'm married to a Congolese. American, I'm uh, a South African American. Uh, this whole issue of tactical uh, violence is overwhelming to us as Africans. Um, there is a need to change the mindset that women are lowest on the totem pole of humanity. Just for starters, I don't know um, if we can also get curriculum in the schools that prepare boys, girls, you know, to be ready to defend themselves so that by the time you think of applying for a job in the police force and so forth, you are empowered. Also, we have a situation whereby um, the privacy issue comes up before uh, safety of women. We need to have DNA of all those that we are paying for to be in the security forces so that uh, when there are rapes, uh, we understand that uh, women are raped and their children are raped. But there is no follow-up, whether this is um, internationally, nationally, or wherever. I would strongly uh, suggest that we have instruments to do that, to bring these uh, people to justice if, if we are a, a source of peace. And lastly, we have to think outside the box now. We are a people who are supposedly free. But freedom means that we need to take the freedom to a higher level than we did in the past. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. Do we have any I have, a re I have a reaction. And uh, I, I agree with you to start with. And uh, I think one of the things that I hope we're now on the cusp of is actually being honest and addressing that those are issues and beginning to gather data. And I'm, I was, I'm quite excited by the, I'm going to get the tool acronym wrong, TCAP, that Got Toby it. was talking about, which actually has soldiers collecting data on some of these topics. Because I've found in actually the assessment process of having people go out and ask those questions, it changes them. Mm -hmm. they, are not, they are not unaffected by being involved and actually looking at it. Because it's real easy to, to just, you know, and you're in a war environment to just shut down and close your eyes and be away from that. But if you're involved in that assessment process and looking at what the, the tactics of mass rape really mean, then you can't close your eyes. And that changes the way you, and you go back to your home capital or wherever you go, you're a different person. And you, you carry that sensitivity, I think, forward into everything that you do. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about that tool and hope to get a chance to see it one day in person when, you know, it's not top secret. Um, <laughs> it's not unclassified. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but on terms of the DNA point, um, the Stemson Center recently published a really interesting uh, document. Uh, Bill Dirch was the head there. And I think it's an excellent piece. And what it talks about is criminal accountability for peacekeepers. And, and it's really was sparked by a lot of the problems in DRC and some other places where peacekeepers misbehaved. And while he doesn't suggest sampling their DNA initially, he does suggest creating um, a system of accountability, criminal accountability, that at least the peacekeepers will model the proper behavior. 
And then that, I think, could in turn serve for taking it to the next level, which is what you're talking about, thinking outside the box and taking it to when you're arming local forces, projecting those standards forward. And, uh, uh, but we still have a ways to go. That's the sad story. But your challenge is one that is well taken, and we should all accept it and try to do our best to take it to that next level. Can I add another sure. point on that? And uh, on the issue of curriculum, I think that's one of the kind of next frontiers of uh, gender work and women in security sector work. There's a great woman that we work with in Macedonia who's looking at how curricula, school curricula in elementary schools are very are gendered. And some one of the things that she's doing is now going into elementary schools and talking about if you have, you know, look at your class president. Is it a boy or is it a girl? And what difference do you think it makes if it's a boy or a girl? Do you think if you have a president who's a boy and a vice president who's a girl, it makes it better? Um, you know, talking at school levels, I know you were talking more about um, defense, actual tactics, but I think, you know, we all know that these issues are shaped at very, very early levels. And when you have girls who are confident to be class presidents and boys who are comfortable with female class presidents at young ages, I think it's, it's going to do an immense um, and important job down the road for paving the way on these issues. So I think it is kind of as we start as the field starts dealing with these issues, we, we're backing up further and further into um, where these, these very deeply held perceptions start getting formed, and obviously they get formed at, at very young ages. Yeah, thank you for your comments and sharing your insight. Please. Uh, thank you. I, I'm Sharon Kotak at the State Department, and I just wanted to follow up on the last comment both by Jackie and by the, uh, uh, the woman who's uh, from South Africa. Um, I, I agree, the, the idea of focusing on curriculum is in grade schools. And I'm wondering, um, have UNICEF and UNESCO uh, kind of been brought in for, uh, for kind of designing curriculum in post-conflict areas? Because I think that this would be excellent. It's something I'd actually never thought of before, but I, I think it really would be good. Thank you. Thank you. I think they have, and I, I don't know the extent to it. I, I think definitely, yes, I've heard about it, but I can't speak any more to it than that, so yeah. to learn more about for sure. I think UNIFEM may also have been involved in that, too, so they would be a place to check. I've seen some stuff on tables before that look like that, <laughs> but I, I, I don't have um, specific recollection. Yeah. And I would just say I actually have a tiny bit of experience with textbooks, um, and just reminding of how, particularly when you're thinking about, um, uh, you know, developing countries um, working with their uh, to reform how their narr how their um, historical narratives are constructed of how critical it is for international partners to really uh, international actors to be partnering with ministries of education and, and local um, and, and national actors to make sure that it's not just the Western perspective that's getting shipped in via a box of books but it's something that they're intimately involved in creating so I know we all know that but um, just to remind it and what we also know is that you know curriculum development is highly political, so we need to uh, also you know tackle it at that level. Um, but it's definitely you know, something to bring up. Do, do we, we have? Do we still have some time? Sure, you please. We we technically have it until eleven thirty. So. Um, I have actually two uh, uh, questions I would like to address. One is to Mr. Uh, Carlson and the other one to uh, uh, Ms. O'Neill. Uh, I came a little bit uh, uh, late when you were talking about uh, Africa, so maybe you may have mentioned uh, something on Africa because you have done a lot of work uh, so far as I can tell in uh, Sudan as well as uh, Liberia. Uh, how do you uh, empower women in a place like uh, DRC, that is uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, where you have had extensive uh, uh, sexual violence and all of these things which are still ongoing right now there. How, how do you deal with that issue there in a, in a conflict situation like you have uh, uh, right now happening in the Congo there? Uh, maybe you can comment on uh, that one and what your uh, organization is doing as an advocate uh, group there. Uh, the, my question to Mr. Carlson is this. You discuss about uh, uh, some of the uh, laws 
which may apply uh, or some of the uh, clauses the United Nations has passed here in relationship to women and what have you there. Uh, if you deal with a situation like you have in Afghanistan or let's say uh, the Middle East where you have a lot of tradition there against actually women, uh, you take uh, Afghanistan where uh, people like the uh, Taliban are asking women to wear burqas and a lot of those things. And I think if they take over, for instance, right now, they're going to expel all the young girls from, uh, from schools, uh, like they have done before, you know, because uh, we have seen that uh, the Taliban have done that. Uh, how do you deal with this uh, situation like this? And uh, some of the uh, laws passed for, by the United Nations to, to help women here and there, but then you have this wall, uh, or traditional wall here. Uh, how do we deal with this? Are we being realistic in applying these laws here as people residing in the Western world versus uh, those people living in traditional society like uh, you have in Afghanistan or even for that matter in the Middle East? Uh, can you comment on this? Thank you. Sure, thanks for your comments. Um, just to kind of back up into that, starting maybe a little bit with what you were asking Scott, I think a lot of it, what you're getting to relates to culture and is it culturally, always culturally appropriate and is there a culture in which this doesn't hold? And I would say that there's no culture in the world where women don't want to have an influence over the decisions that affect their lives. And I think if you start with that basic premise, then you have to look at, well, how can we do it in a way that's appropriate? So we use examples from Afghanistan a lot because people often don't even think it's possible there. You know, you have the Taliban there, you have these images of women in burqas, but you also have women who are doing really incredible work leading their communities. And to answer your question about the Congo, our inclusive security, our approach is that is to work over the longer term in getting more women's, women in positions of leadership and political leadership in the country. So there are a lot of organizations that are providing direct assistance uh, to these victims of this horrible sexual conflict um, and horrible sexual violence. But from our perspective, what really is going to create a stable Congo and stable DRC in the long term is to have more women who are members of parliament and more women who are qualified to be working in the civil service, and more women in the police and the military. And there are a lot of women in Congo, as you know far better than uh, any of us in this room do, who are really capable and interested in doing that, and they may not feel that they have the access right now to doing so. So part of our model is to connect uh, women in the Congo, for example, not with people like us sitting in Washington, but with other African women who have faced similar situations and done really incredible work, like the, the women who wrote in today, um, Humaira from Pakistan, people who are in very different situations and have uh, overcome them to assume positions of leadership. Because we believe, and I think it's very true, that as you get more women in senior positions of political importance, uh, a lot of these issues will then be addressed. So women will be more likely to raise healthcare issues and education issues, curriculum issues, uh, water and sanitation issues, and that's sort of our longer term <coughs> approach to dealing with this. Um, I think your question is an excellent one, and it's one which comes up time and again. And uh, the, what you're basically saying is the, you know, there are these principles, people agree to them, they sound great, but when you get to certain corners of the world, there are these cultural impediments. I think that is true, and I think it is a serious issue, and I, I think, but I think there's some strategies for how to approach that and deal with that. And unfortunately, we've, we've been very late to the game and coming up with some of these strategies, and it's partially because I think we haven't walked the talk. We like to stamp that UN Security Council resolution and say, oh, we're going to enforce these beautiful principles, and then it's, uh, it's kind of a, what I would call a fire and forget approach. Um, and then, but at, at, let's take Af Afghanistan, which you raised. What we're doing now at the U.S. Institute of Peace is we're doing some pilot projects to really understand what are these traditional justice systems. And the preliminary data is they're not uniform. And in many cases, what you find is 
after a war, uh, and, I, and I know for a fact this is a significant issue in uh, northern Uganda, uh, combatants take on the trappings of local traditional dispute resolution, like the Matu Oput there, but then they do something totally different. It's not really in any way related to the traditional structures. And so they just, they opportunistically take advantage of quote unquote local traditions. And they fool a lot of Western aid providers because they come in and go, oh, we don't want to trample your culture. And then they, we'll give you these grants so you can do it yourself. And this, these, these you know, ex-combatants are giggling all the way to the bank because, you know, they couldn't care about the old traditional culture. They just want to control, you know, the property and what's going on in that area. So I think step one is to get good data. And we don't have it. And we don't have a, we don't have a practice of getting that. It's fashionable to talk about, well, we should, we should look at traditional justice systems more. But we don't. And so there were some pilot projects here at, at the Institute, and we're going to get increased uh, support, I think, for the State Department to broaden that. And then when you start to find that they're not all the same, we can't promise it's going to be in all reaches of the country, but we start modeling that. And so the women themselves then are empowered to either potentially A, leave and come to the capital where they can enjoy those rights, or if their local traditional structure has enough flexibility, begin to integrate and introduce those. Um, Legal development is an organic process that takes a long time. It can't be imposed, but it can be nurtured and fertilized. And I think we've finally gotten around to that approach that we can't go in and in two years, you know, make everything beautiful and go bye-bye, have a nice year uh, and life. But we still haven't gotten to the point, which is yours, of really understanding the, 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 the variety and texture of the local fabric, legal fabric enough. But the good news is, we seem to have learned that lesson and begin to be moving in the right direction. We just need to move faster. Thank you. Uh, I think my question was um, mostly answered um, through this gentleman's question. But um, my name is Kristen Lundquist. I'm with the Institute for Global Engagement. Um, and we are a religious freedom organization. And so my question is, have you ever come across maybe any new training curriculum that addresses or analyzes the impact of faith, both the restrictions and opportunities that sometimes come with that on women's involvement in security building on the ground. Thanks. We had actually last week uh, in Washington, D.C., we had a gathering, our annual gathering, we call it our annual colloquium. And this year's theme was women moderating extremism. And we had delegations of women from Bosnia, Pakistan, Rwanda, and Lebanon, uh, including Humaira, actually, from Pakistan, who wrote in. And what a lot of them talked about was research that they're doing um, on the ways that religion is used to uh, create extremism and to sort of, uh, um, you know, to, to incite extremist uh, activities, and then also the ways that women can themselves sort of take back interpretation of, be it the Bible, the Quran, other texts, and work with other women to help them um, to really understand it sort of for themselves. And so it's not a formal curriculum uh, that I can sort of hand to you, but we met, for example, and had here last week a number of uh, Pakistani women who were doing really incredible work uh, in the Swat Valley to work with what they called community peace councils. Um, and they had, they developed this group of women peace practitioners. And they went around and they were just talking to women, sort of helping them educate themselves about what the Quran really is saying on various issues. And it's a way, they've been creating this way for women to actually not just have to inter, or just have to take what people tell them um, as religious doctrine, but to interpret it for themselves. And they, they report that it's gone a really long way uh, in terms of uh, women's ability to influence their husbands, and in particular, their sons, and um, has had some really powerful impacts on their son's interest in joining um, the Taliban, for example. So uh, I think there's a lot to be done on this. And I think you know women really need to lead this uh, themselves as a real sort of free interpretation um, and actual study type of initiative because there are a lot of radio programs and elsewhere around the world that um, that discuss religion and talk about it but there are not always all these instances where women are talking with other women about how it actually relates to their lives so 
Yeah, thank you. My question actually is very much related to the previous one, and that is in 2005 I got engaged with this group in Liberia that was schooling ex-combatants and teaching them um, how to reintegrate into society. Well, it's a faith-based organization, and they are always struggling to find funds, bringing women to um, the birthing centers and wheelbarrows and looking for an ambulance has taken, you know, like five or ten years. And um, just in thinking about engaging faith-based organizations like that that are on the ground, that are doing very efficacious and, and efficient operations, um, how do we empower them to have the funds to go forward and, and you know, replicate those models that they are, are doing with children and, and ex-combatants? and engaging women as well. This particular group had over 100 women that were working within the orphanage, within the school, um, that were working on the same type of issues. Thank you. I think, um, and I am forgetting the exact name right now, um, but maybe Jackie can help me. I think there, there actually are a, a variety of really interesting um, kind of composite uh, women's funds um, that distribute to uh, a whole variety of different women-run NGOs around the world. And I'm not entirely sure exactly how many faith-based organizations may be involved um, with, those, um, with those groups that um, actually the chair of inclusive security is very involved in. But I wonder if that might be, th those might be interesting channels for, um, for expanding uh, uh, resources to, to faith-based organizations. I know there's also a, a and I, I don't know the name of it anymore, I can't remember it, but it's a Geneva-based organization, which is a clearinghouse for faith-based organizations that do development work and this type of combatant reintegration. And they exchange lessons learned and also sometimes logistical support. For example, one will say, well, we have two spare helicopters, can you use them in Liberia? And they will work out a deal. Um, and. I know a lot of major churches uh, I, in my you know, area where I spent most of my time in the Balkans, I know the Greek Orthodox Church was pretty active there and they were very effective um, and it, it meets at least annually to talk about you know, information sharing and resource sharing. But I, it's something like the International Council on Churches or something pretty obvious, but I, I've been drawing a blank now. Okay. Well, with all of that, we'll wrap up. Um, and no final comments or anything? No? Okay. Would you like to make concluding remarks and here and there? Or? No, I just really want to thank the members of the Women Waging Peace Network who wrote in. I just can't stress enough how wonderful it is to hear from you. And I know a 9 o'clock start was early for us here, but it enabled people um, around the world to actually participate before they go and do things that uh, women do all around the world, including make dinner for their families. So really, thank you so much for, for writing in. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was second that. Thank you. And thanks for those, those of you that watched and didn't, uh, didn't weigh in. And uh, we'll continue that uh, to facilitate the dialogue. And uh, hopefully we'll um, you know, get more and more exchange between women in um, the areas where we're, we're working and, and us here in Washington. Any other comments? No? All right, well, yeah, thank you. we'll close. I just have to do make two announcements. Um, we created a um, gender and peace building initiative here at USIP in the beginning of this year, 2010. Uh, we actually have um, you know, an office. We call it a center of innovation. And um, so we were sponsoring a, a lot of events um, around gender. Um, the first one that's coming up is uh, Monday, February 8th. It's called, it's uh, the role of the health sector in addressing gender-based violence. Uh, the second one is uh, the other side of gender-based violence research on perpetrators in Colombia and the DRC. And that will be on February 18th um, in the afternoon. So that, um, both of those will be on our website. So you can check the website, um, you know, and, uh, and sign up if you're interested. So I thank you very much for coming to USIP this morning, and uh, thank you for your comments uh, and uh, your wisdom. And we'll look for the next series, which will be um, April 21st, I believe. Um, but you'll be getting um, emails probably um, letting you know. We'll probably be talking about um, building civil society at that, uh, 
at that um, seminar. So thank you, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you.